I'd like to call the Tuesday, February 13th, 2024, Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the call to order. Um, the second item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I would look for a motion to approve the agenda for the Tuesday, February 13th, 2024, HRA meeting. So moved. We have a motion by uh, Commissioner Doblinger. Second. And a second by Commissioner Wooten to approve the agenda for this evening's meeting. Um, are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Item 3.1 on the agenda is the approval of the January 23rd, 2024 HRA board meeting minutes. Are there any corrections, questions, comments? Hearing none, we'd be looking for a motion to approve the January 23rd, 2024 HRA board meeting minutes. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Mueller and a second by Commissioner Mua to approve the January 23rd, 2024 HRA board meeting minutes. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to new business, item 4.1, award eight project-based house housing choice vouchers to eligible proposal at 70, 700 American Boulevard West. May we have the staff report? Yeah, hi, uh, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Anna Salvador. I'm the Assistant HRA Administrator. With me tonight is Jason Schmidt, uh, who's the Assistant Port Authority Administrator. Um, the item on the agenda tonight is awarding eight project-based housing choice vouchers to el an eligible proposal at 700 American Boulevard West. All right, uh, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. So just wanna quickly give you an overview of this project. Um, so this site is 700 American Boulevard. This is located at the corner of American Boulevard and Lindale Avenue, right next to where the REI uh, shopping center is. And so kind of a, a quick background of the 700 site. So uh, this parcel was purchased uh, during the road reconstruction uh, previously um, in the early 2000s. And at that time, the city uh, obtained ownership of it. And we went through multiple RFPs on this parcel. Um, if you recall, um, we had it uh, slated. It was going to be for a headquarters for a bank. Um, that uh, purchase agreement and development agreement went through, however, uh, they never fulfilled the development agreement, and so then the city obtained owner ownership back of that parcel. We went out again for an RFP. We were in negotiations with Hy-Vee um, to look to do a, a small retail center, center there. Um, however, uh, those negotiations once again fell through, and just recently in 2022, the HRA at that time uh, put out an RFP with the city uh, seeking uh, additional development here, really focusing on multifamily residential. Uh, during that process, uh, Schaefer Richardson was selected as the recipient of that RFP in 2022. And in the spring of 2023, the city council um, adopted a pre-development agreement uh, with uh, Schaefer Richardson uh, for entitlements on this site. Uh, they went through the planning and zoning entitlement process and received uh, zoning entitlement in 2023. We are currently working with them. The Port Authority is currently working with them with regards to financial feasibility, and we were able to obtain a grant application from Met Council, LCDA, uh, LCDA grant. Um, and then lastly, uh, as part of this pre-development agreement, they are required to, uh, to take ownership of this property by January of 2025. Um, however, they have indicated to us that they would like to move forward and purchase this property in May of this year. So the pro proposed project is a 128 unit senior building with 1500 square feet of commercial space on the first floor. It is an income balanced uh, building of 50% AMI. So there are eight units at 30% AMI and that'll be the project based units, uh, which Anna will talk about here shortly. And then there are 104 units at 50% AMI 
And then to round out, um, there are 16 units at 60% AMI. And so when uh, you balance those out, all of the units come out at 50% AMI average. Multiple funding sources are being used uh, to move this project forward. Uh, we'll be looking to create a housing TIF district here. Uh, they will be looking to seek uh, funding from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, there will be bonds as well as they aw were awarded uh, tax credit funding. There will, uh, Port of staff will be before this uh, board on March 12th with a term sheet. Um, this will be an HRA project as well as with the city because the city owns this. And the reason why this will become an HRA project is because of the various funding sources and majority of them are being backed by the H HRA levy. And so just a quick site plan uh, of the building here. Um, you can see the building uh, kind of L shapes along American Boulevard with the parking lot just to the north. And then here's a quick rendering of the building. This is looking at it uh, from the Lindell American Boulevard intersection looking uh, northwest. Um, so a little background quickly about project-based vouchers. Um, so they are a component of the Housing Choice Voucher Program. The rental assistance for these vouchers would be tied specifically to the unit. So it doesn't have the same uh, transferability as a traditional Housing Choice Voucher. If we were to award uh, the project-based vouchers tonight, that funding would be allocated from our existing funds from HUD. So it's not in addition to the, um, it's not additional funds that we would be receiving from HUD. Um, within the city, we currently have 38 project-based units um, in operation, and they're throughout various different uh, projects. Um, we have also um, historically, back in 2023, submitted some in initial intent to HUD that we would be interested in pursuing project-based units somewhere in the city, and that was done back in 2023. There it goes. Okay. I'm just going to scoot over. Um, so we are currently uh, pursuing a non-competitive process, the reason being this project was already approved through a competitive uh, funding process within the last three years of um, requesting the project-based vouchers. And what we're utilizing for this non-competitive process is their private activity bonding application. Under our um, current admin plan, the evaluation criteria that we must use for non-competitive processes are um, to evaluate the extent to which the project fur furthers the PHA goal of deconcentrating poverty and expanding housing and economic opportunities. Additionally, the extent to which the proposal complements other lo local activities, such as the redevelopment of public housing site. Under the HOPE 6 program, the HOME program, CDBG activities, other development activities in a HUD designated enterprise zone, economic community, choice neighborhood, or renewal community. So why project-based voucher makes sense for this particular project is one, we're able to achieve a deeper affordability within the project than may have been possible without the project-based vouchers. Additionally, this project is going to be serving seniors, which as, as has been identified in both the 2040 Comprehensive Plan and our more recent 2022 HRA, um, the, what is that word? Thank you, HRA assessment. Uh, seniors are a growing and extremely underserved population within our community. Um, also additionally, under HOTMA, which is the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act, there, have, there were fixes that made project-based vouchers exclusively for seniors more feasible. So previously, um, before this, it was a more um, administratively burdensome process to restrict the vouchers to a specific population. Under the new guidelines through HOTMA, this is a lot more feasible and um, kind of in line with the direction that HUD is heading. And lastly, the, the project-based vouchers and this project overall align with the city's development goals for the Lindale Corridor. Um, upon approval this evening, the next steps in the process would uh, go through a, a, a couple of HUD reviews, including environmental review and a subsidy layering review of the project. Once those were completed and we've received acceptance from HUD, we would then uh, enter into an agreement to enter into a housing assistance payments contract. Um, and then that would 
that would need to be completed before construction uh, started on the project. Once construction was done, we would then move into the housing assistance payment contract at that time. Um, that concludes my uh, presentation. I'll hand it back over for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Commissioner Doblinger. Uh, any insight on what kind of businesses would be on the first floor? Chair and Commissioners, um, as of right now, it would be complementary uh, to, to a senior residential facility, um, either, um, say, uh, a hairstyle, uh, beautician, um, is some of the, the options that the developer has thrown out. Um, it is a concern of the developer as first floor retail it is kind of a, a struggle to fill in some of these, these facilities, but they, are, um, they were proposing a larger um, space in the beginning with the RFP. However, actually doing a little bit further analysis and then right, right fitting the development based on the parking uh, constraints of this site. Um, that uh, retail space did shrink a little bit um, to make sure that the parking was accommodated and that it could hopefully fulfill a future tenant. Commissioner Wooten. I'm not sure this is appropriate, but being it's going to be a senior site, is it any thought given to possibly having a, an office there that is connected to our community's um, our Creekside for services? And or, you know, other amenities, not amenities, but other necessary um, needs that might be there. I mean, we're going to have a captured audience, so to speak, so. Do you, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, Commissioners, Commissioner Wooten. I don't think that that conversation has moved forward, but it's definitely an idea that we can bring forward. But when we look at the development and what the developer needs to do and what they need to pencil out, for the development on their performa that has to be taken into consideration. And then I'd have to further talk with uh, the city manager and city council on what the plans are beyond uh, Creekside at this point. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, Commissioner Wooten. When is it open for business? <laughs> uh, chair and commissioners, um, the tentative timeline right now is for them to start construction this uh, spring. Um, it would be roughly a 15-month build, so next year, uh, so 2025, summer of 2025 opening. I, I have a, one question. Um, since the HRA wasn't involved with the, um, the Planning Commission was involved in the plans, do, you, do we have an idea of what the green space looks like? I just think with senior housing that green spaces, and I know with the affordable housing um, trust fund that they can, you know, depending on what they're using, some things can be taken away a little bit, if it's not the right terms, but um, cut back. So I just wanted to know if we have kind of an idea of what the green space looks like for this space, this project. Yeah. Uh, chair and commissioners, um, as if I recall, I was looking at the affordable or the opportunity housing ordinance or the affordable housing plan um, that lays out the various incentives th that they that developers seek. And I do not believe they sought a reduction of um, green space on this site. Um, they were seeking reduction in parking. Um, and they, they worked with our engineering division um, to really go down as far as they could, um, with which uh, our planning staff then was able to recommend approval for. And that, that's really what drove uh, the, the layout of this building, as well as the density was the limitation on parking um, on this site. They tried their hardest, uh, Schaefer Richardson tried their hardest to work with uh, the property owners around to see if they could do a shared parking. Uh, none of them were open to that idea. Yet. Um, and we had to move this project, <laughs> we had to move this project along. And so at that point, it was decided Schaefer Richardson was trying to do it solely on this site. And that's when they worked with our engineering planning division um, on the approved plans. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Doblinger and then Commissioner uh, With regards to transportation, you said there's small parking available. So is there transit that's close by that, you know, is easy, easily accessible by somebody who may not be as mobile? 
Uh, chairing commissioners, uh, correct. There is a, there is a transit stop um, along American Boulevard there, as well as on the Richfield side as well. It is a little bit further further walk uh, to do that. Um, however, talking with the developer uh, and based on their needs analysis and looking at other projects that they have done around the metro area with regards to senior uh, facilities and parking analysis, they believe that um, the parking is adequate uh, for their future tenants on this site. Commissioner Wooten. Um, as I looked at the rendering, uh, the, the concern I had was the setback from the uh, curb, being in a senior building, possibly a need for a great deal more space for, uh, for mobility, um, you know, challenging mobility issues, and also snow clearance and those kinds of things. Is that something that's being considered? Well, I'm sure it's being considered. To what degree is it being considered? Yes, uh, chairing commissioners. Uh, so the, the building and everything has been entitled. So the, the site plan that I showed you is the actual setbacks and everything with regards to, to where this development has been approved. Um, as far as snow clearance and everything, that is on the, the developer and their maintenance, their property management team uh, to make sure that, that they are, are clearing, clearing the sidewalks um, and to making sure that the mobility um, is there for all pedestrians, both the residents as well as um, just pedestrians uh, utilizing the sidewalk along American Boulevard. Uh, I just want to add, uh, Chair and Commissioners, that the Planning Commission has reviewed the affordable housing plan as well as um, the renderings and how this project, this building, will be situated on the site to be in conformity with our um, requirements. Uh, however, Tonight, we are um, asking you to uh, see this project because you've seen it for the first time with this request for the project-based vouchers and to provide a um, motion and or vote on that. This will come back before you uh, because as administ um, Assistant Administrator uh, Schmidt has mentioned, this would be a housing tax increment financing district as well as a request for affordable housing trust fund. Therefore, it does have to have to come back before the HRA for some of those decisions as well. Um, and we will make sure to provide more information about how the building would be situated on the site and a few more renderings and information for you to answer some of these questions that you may have this evening. Thank you for the clarification. I think with it being new, there was just some some questions. So. Reorganizing back to the topic at hand, is there any questions regarding the voucher request? I just want clarification. It would stick with the project. That's the, ba the you know, just for clarification, making sure everybody understands they will not move with any specific person, just stay with that building. And so that building will consistently have eight project vouchers for the life of the building. Chair and commissioners, thank you for the question. Um, so generally, the project-based voucher HAP contract has a term of, at minimum, I believe it's 10 years, um, and with the option of extending it. Um, so not necessarily guaranteed for the whole project, but uh, most often we see that they do get extended. So, Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any other questions? Hearing no questions, we will look, be looking for a motion to approve and award eight units of project-based voucher rent assistance to Schaefer Richardson, 700 American Boulevard West. We have a motion by Commissioner Wooten and a second by Commissioner Doblinger to approve and award eight units of project-based voucher rent assistance to Schaefer Richardson, 700 American Boulevard West. Is there any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item 4.2, Opportunity Housing Ordinance Amendments. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. We'll see the presentation pop up here. And you'll be happy to hear that tonight's presentation is not long. It will not be more than an hour. In fact, it will be far less than an hour. So... Thank you for having me back. So this is the Opportunity Housing Ordinance proposed amendments. This is an item that we brought last month for a study session. And tonight, this is the consideration to recommend approval of the proposed amendments to City Council. So 
just to give you a, a refresher on what the timeline has been for these amendments, we had study sessions last month. It went to Port Authority first, then to Planning Commission, and then to HRA. This month, uh, it's starting with HRA, uh, and it's also going to Planning Commission this week, and then to Port Authority next week. And then, if all goes well, it'll go to City Council on March 18th. So, since uh, we were last here, we took the feedback that you gave and the other commissions gave. We also received feedback from uh, some of the developer community, as well as um, within our departments and divisions, going over some of the, the proposed amendments, as well as uh, workshopping revisions based off of feedback that was received. So just to give kind of a broad summary of feedback, um, in Port Authority, we emphasized the importance of uh, any changes, any requirements that the Opportunity Housing Ordinance uh, sets onto developers that those be enforceable and that we can ensure that when we come back with uh, monitoring con and compliance that we can look at those requirements and know that they're being met. Uh, with regards to HRA and Planning Commission, we had emphasis on the parking reduction um, discretion for city engineer to require a parking study and wanting to get more clarity on when that would come into play as well as um, what, like which developments that would apply to. We also discussed uh, in planning division, there was a proposed amendment relating to the impervious surface reduction and the feedback from that session was that that item uh, move forward alongside the planning division's 2024 office to residential conversion work item. Uh, there was also discussion across the commissions with regards to the storage space reduction, understanding, uh, again, what would that requirement look like? What, how, has that, how would that have applied to recent developments? And um, getting, we needed to get feedback from developers on what the usage of those storage spaces were. And then there was also feedback from the body across the, the commissions and boards on continuing to maintain the OHO as a living document and bringing forth uh, kind of the, the accomplishments, the takeaways of the OHO and making sure that it comes before you on a regular basis. So since that session, uh, those sessions, there were some major revisions to these three uh, sections. So the impervious surface area um, increase the parking reduction and the storage space reduction. So we'll go through these three. So the impervious surface area maintenance, this is the incentive that um, the planning commission provided feedback on that this would make most sense to be considered alongside the 2024 work item for office to residential conversion. So that's on the planning division's uh, docket for 2024. So the revised uh, amendment that you'll see in the ordinance before you is to remove the impervious surface area maintenance, uh, impervious surface area reduction incentive for now, and then reconsider uh, kind of the retooling of that incentive when planning division takes a look at um, these environmental sustainability related code items. With section 9.19, the parking reduction uh, the feedback was uh, to give developers more clarity when this discretion kicks in with regards to the city engineer or designee requiring a parking study uh, and ensuring that these requirements are responsive to what reductions have been sought so far by developers. So we were able to connect with the developer community to discuss this and look back at our previous developments that uh, that received parking reductions. So of, of the most recent 13 developments that received a parking reduction, the average reduction was 28%. So uh, we've revised the proposed amendment to uh, the discretion only kicks in if a development is seeking a reduction of 30% or more. And if that had been applied to previous developments, that would have applied to five of those 13 developments. So this is being responsive to um, the concerns that were heard within the de the uh, community development department, as well as residents within Bloomington uh, with those developments that had parking issues. This would only apply to those developments seeking that highest level of reduction. Uh, if you recall, the previous proposal was 10%, so we've gone from 10 to 30%. And then the final major re revision is to section 9.23, uh, the storage space reduction. 
So the feedback was to look into the, the relevance of this proposed incentive um, for affordable housing development in regards to the provision or the uh, development of 30% AMI units and understand uh, with these developments the storage space usage. So we were able to connect with uh, the development community on this and the feedback provided was that as originally drafted, which uh, if you recall, it was if um, 20% of total units were provided at 30% AMI, the parking space re uh, requirement could be reduced by 100%. The feedback from the development community is that that reduction doesn't move the needle enough to make those 30% AMI units feasible. Uh, and that would be for uh, like a more standard affordable housing proposal. So the re the, with this revision, what we're aiming for is to push those developments that are already providing 30% AMI units to provide maybe just one or two extra units. So um, for those developments that we've had recently that did provide 30% AMI units, so think Oxborough Heights, think 700 American that you just heard of, those are typically providing around six to eight percent of their total units at 30 percent ami so the intent is uh, if that threshold for them accessing this reduction is reachable by only providing one or two additional units uh, then maybe that that needle does move enough for those developers to provide those units so and then as you'll see the proposed reduction is 90 percent rather than 100 percent and that's based off of feedback from the developer community. Uh, they provide they provided the feedback that for their developments that uh, they build, the the market driven usage of storage bases is to provide ten percent of total dwelling units with a, with an external storage space. So this is uh, this the intention here is to be in line with what the development community wants to build essentially. So um, happy to, ask, to answer questions on that. That's a, kind of a very technical change, um, but those are the three major revisions since the last time you saw this um, and happy to take questions on those and anything else you saw now that you've seen the actual ordinance resolution that was in the packet. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? There are no questions. Then we'd be looking for a motion to re recommend approval of the amendments to the Opportunity Housing Ordinance by the City Council. We have a motion by Commissioner uh, Wooten. Second. And a second by Commissioner Mueller to recommend approval of the amendments to the Opportunity, Ho Opportunity Housing Ordinance by the City Council. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item 4.3, 1801 and 1851 American Boulevard West parcels update. May we have the staff report? All right, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, once again, Jason Schmidt, Assistant Port Authority Administrator, um, here to talk about 1801 and 1851 American Boulevard West. This parcel, um, even though it has two addresses, it's one legal description. It's an interesting thing at Hennepin County. Um, is this parcel that the HRA owns um, for development? So quickly, just want to identify where this is located. This is located at the corner of American Boulevard and Knox Avenue in the Penn American District, just south of the Southtown Shopping Center. Just a closer look and rendering. Uh, it's about a 1.81 acre parcel. To give you kind of the existing conditions, this is uh, to date looking to the south. You see the district apartments there in the background. And then this is along Knox Avenue. You see the orange uh, bus rapid transit stop uh, right there on the left-hand side, and then the district apartments in the back. And so previously, uh, staff was before this board uh, last year. It was actually January of 2023, um, but we wanted to bring this item back before you just as an update, and that's what this is tonight. 
Um, so at that time, uh, we were before the board with a letter of intent from Knox American LLC 2, um, which is an entity with Stewart Companies. Stewart Companies is the developer that built the district apartments as well as worked on Genesee Apartments, the first phase of Pan American District. At that time, they were proposing a multifamily uh, apartment complex that they would like to, to uh, enter into a letter of intent with the HRA on this site. Um, they were following the OHO of 9% of the units um, were going to be affordable. Uh, working with the developer and, and through negotiations, um, we had it so that instead of it being 60% AMI for those 9%, we went a little bit uh, deeper at 50% AMI, so a little bit further than what our OHO uh, ordinance has. As part of uh, that letter of intent, the purchase price of this lot was going to be for $2 million. Um, however, the offer is for $1,225,000 because the HRA still has a financial commitment to the district departments in the amount of $775,000. And so to make sure to basically offset that, um, so we are reducing the amount that we would sell this land to Stewart Company uh, by $775,000, and then we would no longer have that additional, HRA would no longer have that financial obligation to the district departments. And at, the, and at that January 2023 uh, board meeting, uh, this board directed staff to move forward with a negotiations of a purchase and a development agreement um, for further discussions. So just quickly, high level vision here. So this is the Pan American District Plan vision, looking at trying to, to create an urban and residential feel uh, to the Pan, Pan American District area. Uh, prior to 2012, there were no residential units besides um, Knox Landing, um, which is actually just a little bit outside of the Pan American District within this area. Um, in 2012, um, that is when the Phase 1 and Phase 2 projects were introduced uh, to the City Council and the HRA. The HRA was heavily involved in financially assisting these project in, projects and moving them forward, as well as with the creation of creating the, the block structure with West 80 and a half Street, um, 81st Street, and then uh, on Nolan uh, Road as well. So the first project that opened up phase one was the Genesee Apartments, just over 200 units of market rate um, apartments and retail on the first floor. Uh, this was right around 2012. Phase two uh, came next, so that was just to the north. This was the retail portion of, of the development. Uh, we were able to get a grocery store in here with the fresh time, and then it anchored um, on the other side with home two suites, the hotel, as well as uh, first line retail on the bottom. And uh, we do have uh, Mallard's is the restaurant that is in there now. So Pen American phase three, that kind of went forward, and that was the district apartments. And so that just opened up here uh, last year. And so once again, that project created 20% uh, of the units at 50% AMI, and then the rest is, is a market rate project. So this is a quick uh, pictures of the district apartments. And so as I previously stated, that phase three financial agreement, um, the HRA was to give a $2 million forgivable loan uh, as part of that financial incentive package. However, at that time, um, what the HRA was going to do or what the city was going to do at HRA was they were going to sell this parcel, 1801, for $2 million uh, to a private entity that was looking to come in um, and develop there. However, during that entitlement process, uh, the developer or the development decided to walk away because they received, um, uh, they did not receive approval from the Planning Commission on their plans and they didn't want to bring it before the City Council. And so at that time, it was nego the HRA negotiated with the developer um, instead of giving them a $1,225,000 forgivable loan. And then they were able to, that developer, Stuart Co., uh, was able to have an exclusive negotiation agreement on this 1801 and 1851 American Boulevard parcel. And if the property was sold to a different entity, the remaining portion that was owed to them, that 775,000, would have been due at the time of that sale. 
in uh, December of 2022, the developer exercised their exclusive negotiation right, and that's when we came before this board in January of 2023 with that. So these are some quick renderings of the uh, apartment complex that they are proposing at this location. Um, it should be noted that they have received all zoning entitlements from our planning and uh, city council. So this is another uh, location, but uh, looking from American Boulevard. So the, the uh, parking lot is facing American Boulevard and the apartment complex is adjacent to 80 and a half street, similar to the district apartments. And so the development and purchase agreement that we are currently working on with them is based on the terms of that letter of intent. Once again, the purchase price would be for $1,225,000. Uh, we would hold a public hearing uh, for that sale of that parcel at an upcoming uh, HRA board meeting. The multifamily apartment project is slated to be 99 units. As previously stated, 9% nine of, of those units are going to be at the 50% AMI level. And the sale is going to be contingent on this development occurring. So making sure that this development does move forward and it's not just a land um, hold. And so as I stated, this is an information only item tonight. Uh, we will be back before uh, this board on March 12th for that consideration of that purchase and development agreement. And if this board approves that, the tentative sale of that property would be right now looking at March 20th, so a quick turnaround. And the developer has stated they would like to start construction early spring. And so with that, I am open for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? There are no questions. Thank you for bringing this for um, information. Very excited for this project, actually. <laughs> Um, moving on to item 4.4, .4. it's the annual housing report 2023 presentation, all things housing. May we have the staff report. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. It's uh, really awesome to see you all again. Um, hasn't been that long, but it's another annual housing report that I have to share, or data that I have to share with you. Um, this is preliminary data from the recent census release that came out in December. Um, and then the full report will be coming in the next few months, kind of on a similar schedule. But we want to share kind of our uh, accomplishments and the data that we have available. So I'll be taking you through demographics, existing housing, the affordability, and uh, Kenny will be taking you through the HRA accomplishments. Uh, so we're tag teaming today. So here's the demographics in bold. You'll see our 2022 numbers. We are over 90,000 in population. Um, and we've also uh, almost at 40,000 households. So we are continuing to grow. There was uh, a, some um, appeal made to the Met Council uh, about our population numbers in order to actually get a higher population uh, recorded with them. Um, this kind of helps in a lot of different things in making sure that we're getting the right apportionment of benefits and attention based on our population. Uh, so that was approved and this is represented in the chart that you see here. Our average household size, our households with children, our residents over, uh, over the age of 65 and median age have all remained about the same as last year. There's some minor differences of either one or two percentage points, um, and that is kind of typical from one census data year to the next as they kind of take their sample size and perform their formulas. Uh, so these slight adjustments are kind of showing that we're just kind of steady on trend um, and nothing um, significant has happened to disrupt that trend. So in our demographics, we are holding steady in the distribution across race, race and ethnicity. Um, so we are continuing to diversify um, as we grow. Uh, and that is represented in some of the numbers. We've had some increases in population in some areas, um, but with the 
boring margin of error kind of things, we're holding steady and continuing on our trend of becoming a more diverse community. This is the this is the pie chart that I showed you last year. Uh, typically, housing stock doesn't change significantly from year to year, so this is just to kind of refamiliarize uh, yourself with our proportions across housing unit type as we continue to explore the rest of the data uh, that talks about affordability and the kind of general types of units that are available for renting and for home ownership. Um, so as you can see, single family homes still a majority of our, are still a majority of our housing stock. Um, and then multifamily are typical our, our rentals. Um, category is still about a third, um, even with new units. And also that condos, townhomes, and other types of home ownership, home ownership opportunities are the smallest part of our housing stock. Um, of um, about a little uh, um, like 80, 000, 80 to 90,000 housing units. So this is showing our single family rental licensing. Um, our number for last year was 1,387 licenses for single family homes. Um, the new license data for 2023 is not available yet. Environmental Health is still uh, creating their memo from last year. Um, so this data was pulled here, kind of just shows that throughout the years, even with new licenses and licenses that kind of expire or not are renewed, we're staying steady. So in housing tenure, the national or uh, United States nationwide uh, minutes and Minnesota and Bloomington all stayed about the same as last year in the split between um, uh, those uh, renter-occupied units and owner-occupied units. Um, white Hispanic, white non-Hispanic, uh, two or more races and some other race and black or African-American all saw slight increases in home ownership. Um, all other categories, though, saw decreases in home ownership. And those were about two to three percentage points. So it's kind of on the line there where I would consider that possibly something that census data with their sampling accounts for the difference, but also it could be um, representative of the continuing housing crisis where ownership is becoming less available, um, or it could be new population moving in, they're renting first before they're buying. So I think there's kind of a mix of potential variables that would sh produce that type of um, a, a result, and I think it's just important to continue to monitor that over the next you know, two or three years to see where the trend is really going especially as we lead into 2040, where we would have our decennial census, uh, which is a sampling, oh, a huge sample size, which could really tell us uh, where uh, the trend is going. So it's just something to keep an eye on in the next few years. For income and employment, um, you can see 2022 there. There was a huge jump for the Bloomington's median area, uh, median income. We went from 80,000, a little over 80,000 to over 87,000. Also, there was a pretty significant jump in Hennepin County, going from 85,000 to 92,000. Um, and then the region saw, saw dig decreases. I think um, in probably many of the news sources and data that you may have seen over the last year, uh, could see why suddenly we have, uh, we've had steady from 2010 to 2021, and now it's looking a little wonky, where the Hennepin County has saw this huge increase, and now Bloomington and the region are on the same median income. Um, so that could be a variety of factors related to unemployment um, or uh, uh, the main industries in each of those regions. If they had major layoffs or the, if that industry was hit hard, we could see why there might have been a little bit of drop of income where Bloomington may have caught up depending because of the industries that we rely on within the city. The regional area, uh, area median income from HUD also were updated. Um, so the 80 per, uh, all income levels have increased. Um, <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> um, so now we're at um, 125,000, about for 100% AMI. Um, and then at 60% AMI, where typically a lot of assistance kicks in, uh, we're at just under 75,000. Um, that just kind of shows um, that a variety of variables. But one big one could be that 
inflation or costs are outpacing um, income increases or wages um, as well <coughs> excuse me as well as just kind of the cost of goods in general including housing for unemployment, Bloomington saw a continued decrease of the unemployment from 2.7% to 2.5%, but in mentioning kind of our median income, the region saw an increase in unemployment, which could kind of explain why they actually went down while we went up in income um, and why we're at kind of the same level. Um, also, Hennepin County saw continued decreases in unemployment as well. Housing cost burden across income bands remained uh, fairly the same from last year to this year. You still see the highest likelihood of being housing cost burden when you make less than $75,000, <laughs> um, which is uh, kind of a terrifying number to think that that's where you're at um, in order to kind of have more housing security. Um, and especially those uh, incomes that are less than $35,000, um, you have an a huge likelihood of being housing cost burden if you're in those income bands. Our, uh, homeowner, <clears throat> owner occupied households saw a slight decrease in housing cost burden while renter uh, occupied uh, households saw, or renter <clears throat> uh, households saw an increase in housing cost burden. In home ownership, <coughs> Pardon me. Um, in homeownership and affordability, we're kind of looking at the 30% to 80% AMI uh, numbers that I showed you before. Um, those, so the income level thresholds have increased and the affordable housing uh, home price has decreased. Um, so that means that with the still continued increased cost in homes, um, there's an even larger gap between income affordable housing prices and the real prices that things are selling for. And as you can see here, there was 65% uh, of, uh, of home purchases last year were single family homes um, at a number much larger, at a medium sales price much larger than the affordable home price indicated by HUD. You also see some areas where there could be some affordability in condos, townhomes, possibly um, for 80% AMI, um, <coughs> and maybe zero lot line, which is uh, two units that have uh, share a wall but have two separate PIDs. Um, and then referring back to the pie chart that shows our housing stock distribution, those are kind of a small spot, spot or part of our housing stock. and no new townhomes or condominiums are being really built right now. It's a slow or no growing um, housing stock type right now. Um, could change in the future, but currently it's really that single family homes that most people would have access to. Um, and then the price is um, pretty significantly different than, or higher than what most can afford. And then the median home value chart I show here that shows the increases, this is based off of the January 2nd assessment um, that is done. So this is home value, not necessarily home sale price, uh, which is why I show you both uh, the line graph as well as the chart. Um, so even in home value, there's still a significant gap between affordability uh, and uh, incomes. For our renting affordability, <coughs> you can see that the average, right, uh, average rent has increased a little bit since last year. Um, but if you look at studios through three bedrooms, you might notice that there's actually some big increases in the average rent for each unit. Um, this is kind of uh, a flaw of the data a little bit. Um, we don't necessarily have every, um, from CoStar and Marquette Advisors is where we get our data from. Um, they own like apartments.com, so they have the best access database for these things. Um, we don't have reported rents for every unit type of these types in the city. Um, so there's likely something in the data that is skewing it to be only a couple of dollars higher, whereas each unit type is showing a much more increase than that. You know, like for studios alone, we're seeing you know, uh, you know, a 60 or $70 increase 
which for someone who is really struggling finding affordable housing can be significant and can mean moving out of a studio. Uh, so there's kind of a flaw in the data, but it is useful to kind of see average rent for trends. Also, we have <coughs> our NOAA units. Um, are, so we actually have uh, uh, higher reported like studio uh, units. So last year when I showed you the data, we only had data on about 588 units. Now we have 651. So the database is uh, got a little bit stronger this year for some of the uh, categories with increases in actual units, uh, like areas reporting their unit prices. And so that's why we see studios having kind of a big jump from last year up to like 83% of the available um, studios are NOAA properties. Um, and also there was a, like a little bit increase, about 6% of an increase in total NOAA units overall. Now I'll hand it off to Kenny and he'll talk about the accomplishments. Cool. Thanks, Michelle. So yeah, we're gonna talk through some of the accomplishments for the 2023 year and talk through some of the different programmatic offerings that the HRA has. So you'll see uh, at the top, right beneath the HRA program accomplishments header, uh, we're highlighting the area that these programs fall under. So in this case, it's housing stability and home ownership. And you'll see later, uh, we'll look at uh, residential development um, and services. So under housing stability and home ownership is our various housing choice voucher programs. Um, these different programs target different populations and communities in need. So um, just to talk through, uh, broadly for tenant-based vouchers. So this is what most people think of when they think of housing choice vouchers. This is a, a voucher that follows that, that household as they go. If they move, they still retain that voucher and they can uh, live in whatever housing uh, scenario they please. That's a 461 voucher capacity that we have. And then 65 of those are um, currently using their Bloomington designated vouchers in other cities. And we'll talk more about that portability aspect of vouchers. Um, then there's the VASH program, that's Veterans Assistance for Supportive Housing. So that's rental assistance um, to help homeless veterans uh, with uh, case management and clinical service provided by the VA. So it's a comprehensive, in addition to the vouchers, they're receiving services to help them stay stable in their housing. There's four households in, in Bloomington that are utilizing those vouchers. For the FYI Foster Youth to Independence program, that's housing assistance for youth at least 18 years and not more than 24 years of age who left foster care or will leave foster care within 90 days um, and who are at risk of becoming homeless at age 16 or, or older. Um, so that's, to again, to help housing stability for the specific population. There's eight households in Bloomington with those vouchers. And then I mentioned portability. So within the Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, portability refers to the process with which families can transfer or port their rental subsidy when they move to a location outside of the jurisdiction of the public housing agency that first gave them the voucher when they were selected for the program. So you can see 65 of Bloomington's vouchers are in other cities and we're actually, um, we have 124 of those vouchers within Bloomington that have ported in. And then we also have project-based vouchers, which you heard about tonight. Um, so existing, we have 38 project-based vouchers. Um, and then within those project-based vouchers, there are some that are in specific units that are part of our assisted rental program. So that little call out on top is just uh, some accomplishments for some of those households. Two of those households moved or turned uh, turned over. They exited the program. So one house household was able to exit the program and achieve self-sufficiency, which is a great goal to achieve. And then another household was actually able to purchase a home. So across all of those different types, um, we're working with 700 households. So you can imagine the amount of work that goes into that. Um, and really what these vouchers are achieving for those, um, those households with that service is giving them the opportunity to live across uh, in housing across that housing spectrum. So they're able to take these vouchers and apply to the housing types and into, that, into the location that they please. Um, the reality with Housing Choice Voucher in Minnesota is that landlords are legally able to reject households that have vouchers. Um, 
and you may have saw recently Minneapolis uh, got a, their successful appeal to have um, an anti-discriminatory clause within that city that households can't uh, property managers can't reject households that have those vouchers just on the basis that they have vouchers. Uh, and I want to highlight that the state may be considering that going statewide. So that would ensure that um, our households that have that voucher would be able to be considered fairly um, to live in these these households, uh, to live in a home. So um, additionally, with our housing stability and home ownership programs, we have the uh, we have home ownership pathway programs. So the rental homes for future home buyers program uh, helps families save money to buy a, ho a ho house in the future. Families achieve their goal uh, of buying a house as they pay rent and escrow to the HRA. Uh, the HRA ho saves the family's escrow each month, places it into a special interest-bearing account, and as uh, when they reach that threshold, when they reach the the point where they can purchase a home, um, they're able to take that saved escrow money and put it toward a down payment to buy their own home. So, in addition, as those households are within this program, they're receiving uh, or they're they're working with the HRA to set goals and get prepared to uh, enter into home ownership. So, uh, in 2023, five households moved or turned over. Three were able to purchase homes and two households are hoping to purchase at a later date. So there's also our Journey to Home Ownership program, and this is a partnership with Project for Pride in Living um, that presents monthly workshops, and these workshops are designed to uh, create successful first-time home buyers. So there's a lot of steps to that home buying process, and within this program, households are able to learn the basics, uh, have Q&A sessions with real estate professionals and home ownership advisors, and get on-site financial and home ownership counseling. And the this year we've also op offered this uh, in partnership with uh, PPL in different languages. So that's really great to, to reach a wider part of Bloomington's residents. Uh, so within that program, there's 108 registrants over the 11 month time frame, And we know that nine participants were able to go on and purchase homes. And then finally, I'll mention our real, real property acquisition efforts in 2023. And you'll see this called out again when we go to the other area um, of the HRA, but within housing stability and home ownership, we did purchase one home um, for inclusion in the rental homes for future home buyers program. So as I was mentioning, we have two areas and the other is the residential development and services area of the HRA. So here I'm calling out our home ownership assistance programs. Um, and I'll first reference that real property acquisition that I mentioned before. So the, the other efforts that happened in 2023 is that five lots were purchased as well as two homes that were purchased and demolished. And those are uh, with the eventual expectation of redevelopment and may be appropriate for the, um, the Bloomington Affordable Home Ownership Program. Uh, which you hopefully have heard about. It's very exciting and will eventually create, uh, initially create 27 new construction single family homes. So we're, we're working toward starting that um, even in 2023. Uh, and so with our loans that I'm highlighting here, we have the Bloomington Home Improvement Loan Programs. And this is to provide Bloomington owner occupied households with funds to maintain, repair and improve their homes. This is up to $50,000 plus $10,000 for accessibility improvements. It's a 30 year loan term with 2% interest for the first 10 years of the loan. And there are no monthly payments required, um, but the loan is repaid if the home is sold no longer occupied as the primary residence or if the senior mortgage is concluded in any way. So uh, in 2023, 37 loans were approved and you, that's uh, a total loan assistance amount of over $1 million. The average loan amount was uh, only 30000 so basically half of what they could have um, got for their improvements. Uh, and then additionally, in 2023, 35 of the loans issued in previous years were repaid in full, and that was uh, approximately a million dollars that the HRA, HRA received back. And same thing with the average repayment amount. You can see that was around $30,000. So the other program that is related to home improvement is our housing and environmental loan program. 
Uh, so this helps uh, provide Bloomington owner-occupied households with forgivable loan funds to be used for emergency repairs without completing a full-scale rehab project on their home and without signing a, a long-term repayment agreement. So this loan provides up to $9,999 and is forgiven over a three-year time period. So that, that gets completely forgiven for that homeowner. So there are nine loans approved in 2023. Uh, that's a total of $63,000, and the average loan amount for that program was $7,000. And then finally, for down payment assistance, uh, the HRA partners with NeighborWorks Home Partners to administer the Bloomington Homebuyer Mortgage Assistance Program. And uh, this helps Bloomington uh, home buyers with assistance to purchase a home at a zero interest rate, uh, and that loan gets forgiven in three years. And that loan is $10,500. Uh, $10, so in 2023, 14 loans were approved. That's around, or that is $147,000. Every applicant took the full amount. Um, and you, the interesting call out here is the average home pr purchase price was around $307,000. And if you recall earlier, the affordable home uh, set by Met Council, that level was around $304,000. So you can see we were very close to that affordable home purchase price for our program here. So finally, I'm just going to quickly talk about some new development um, and talk about our accomplishments with regards to um, development of affordable units. So uh, for total market rate and affordable units um, activity in 2023, there is uh, 1,500 units. 23% of those were at an affordable level. Um, that's important to call out because our OHO requires 9% of affordable. So we're seeing that developers are uh, either going beyond what a requirement is or they're proposing developments that are 100% affordable and they're pushing that percentage up. So we can hope to, to see that trend continue. Uh, for those uh, those activities in 2023, this table here breaks out, um, the colorful table breaks out um, for projects that were open in 2023. There were two developments, uh, and they had across those two de developments 50 units affordable at 60% AMI. Currently under construction, uh, there are nine units affordable at the 30% AMI, 37 at 50, 43 at 60, and then 50 at 70. And it's worth remembering that 70 isn't considered affordable um, for purposes of the OHO, of the Opportunity Housing Ordinance, but it is still a below market rate um, affordability level. So it, it, it's still beneficial to have those units. And then uh, developments that were approved in 2023, um, you can see those eight units of 30% AMI, that's 700 American that we were just talking about earlier. So we hope to see that develop. Um, that same development is bringing um, part of this 50% AMI, um, so there's another development, and that totals up to 113 at 50, and then 35 at 60. And then f in terms of getting toward our 2030 Met Council goals, uh, you can see starting from the right side, we've exceeded the total amount of new units mar that's market rate or affordable. Um, and Please note that this includes opened, under construction, and approved. So there are approved units that haven't developed yet, and this is including those um, for purposes of our tracking. So if all of those approved units were to be developed, we would achieve our goal with regards to new units. We would achieve our goal with regards to units affordable at 60%, uh, 30% or below. We would achieve our goal with regards to market rate and with regards to 60% AMI units. We would achieve our goal with regards to 50% AMI units, but we've got a long way to go for 30% AMI units. So we hope to emphasize that with um, the developments that get proposed going forward, that we want to see those units in Bloomington. So um, just to wrap things up, here are those two developments I referred to that were completed in 2023. That's Carbon 31 and Riser Senior Apartments. They both took the the 9%, so they, they developed that 9% of units at 60% AMI. And then projects in the pipeline for 24, um, you can see the Ardor is our one market rate, fully market rate pr project, so they paid that fee in lieu that they're planning to apply to a future affordable development. Uh, 700 American, Noble Apartments, Noble Apartments uh, is expected to open in the next two months. Same with Oxboro Heights, so um, It'll be great to have those units online. 1801 American Boulevard received its final development approval, and 6701 West 78th Street um, also received its final development approval. So still a lot of activity going on in Bloomington. 
And I think, yeah, Michelle and I are happy to take questions on anything we talked about. <laughs> Commissioner Issei. Um, I just had a question about the home ownership uh, assistance program. Is it, well, two questions actually. So um, is it limited to first time home buyers? And then secondly, is it limited to one home per household? So say if there's like a husband and a wife, can they only get one house or can the husband get one and then the wife apply for another one? <laughs> Thank you, Chair, Commissioners. Commissioner Issei, I can actually answer that question. Um, so the Bloomington Home Buyer Mortgage Assistance Program is actually funded with American Rescue Plan Act dollars, which are limited funds that we receive from the U.S. Uh, Department of Treasury um, around the pandemic. Um, and so for this program, what the HRA Board and the City Council approved is that, um, one, this is not restricted to first-time home buyers. We never made that restriction. What is in the program guidelines for using this down payment assistance is a requirement for one-to-one -one financial counseling at least 30 days before closing, as well as the um, home stretch, realizing the American dream and or framework um, home buyer education courses that have certificates. Those courses and that one-to-one -one financial counseling usually are attended by first-time home buyers but to use this funding, that is not a requirement. It is a requirement that the household has to be at 80% area median income adjusted for household size. And then lastly, no. If there is a husband and wife, because they would be legally married, they would have to occupy the home as their primary residence. Um, so maybe if they're not if they're going through something and they are not choosing to live together, then separately, yes, but they cannot use each other and their income to qualify for the down payment assistance. And all of this would be discovered because in Minnesota, it's one to buy and two to sell. And so when you're legally married, it does show up on the paperwork. And any other questions? Commissioner Muwa. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I, I want to just thank staff um, for all of this because it shows the amount of dedication and effort that we've had over the last, not just last year, but over the last um, few years. And so very excited to see us continue to do the work that we've done uh, here in 24. We set the bar pretty high in 23, so um, looking for staff to continue that, that great work. Um, one thing I'm particularly interested in is the demographics piece of it. Uh, especially with the school board or the school district coming out that there's a $4 million deficit for the school district next year. It was interesting to see, if you go back up to the, uh, um, yes, this one, to see that Bloomington has grown and continues to grow, but our school age population, one of their big reasons that are, are, we're not having enough enrollment. And so it, kind of, it just sheds that light of we're growing but the people moving here are either single, don't have kids, older, and so it's, it's not doing much to uh, move that needle. And so it's causing issues across the board, right? Issues that we didn't really look at or, or predict. And so um, I'd be interested to see what we can do this year to kind of take a look at that as the demographics continue to change. As we continue these developments, um, you know, what, what can we do as a city, as an HRA board um, to encourage kind of you know, the, the change in demographics to support not only the city, but the school district to make sure that Bloomington is um, prosperous moving forward. So I thought that was just really interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. I do want to add to your comment, um, Commissioner Mua, is that um, one, and um, Ms. Lincoln or Mr. Niemeyer can chime in, the data kind of lags because it is based on the updated American Community Survey five-year estimates, which is based on people actually participating in the census. Um, and I just bring that forward just because um, with what the school district um, has brought forward, but also just what we have seen in um, news and heard from um, our school district partners, there is an increase in um, new arrivals and children of new arrivals in our school districts. And we're not quite capturing those numbers yet. Um, and so I do want to bring that forward because that does contribute to um, the need where there may be a deficit because there are more children, but for the forecasting and the numbers that the school district had at the beginning of the year, 
those have totally gone out the window for what they have actually seen in reality and then the resources that are available to meet the current needs now. And so um, I do expect this data to change and we will keep all of this in mind because when it does change, we want to make sure we are clear on why it changed and why it changed so drastically, which what may look like over the course of a year, um, but in all actuality, it's been changing for a few years. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? I would just like to second the thank you so much for the hard work and bringing this to us. It's great to see the accomplishments. It's great to see the demographics. It's great to see where we've come and where we're going. So I look forward to the future. And I know this took a lot on staff, so thank you for this. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. It was a pleasure to give this data to you again. I literally love sharing it, and I love seeing the look on your faces as you absorb it all and use it to create more housing and affordable housing over the course of the year. So thank you. All right. With that, we'll be moving on to organizational business. Item 5.1 is the HRA board meeting calendar. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Chair Huhim. Um, so in your packet, I have provided the HRA board meeting calendar um, for beginning with January 2024 through February 2025. Um, the reason I added January and February just so you could have a full uh, grounding. Um, however, I just want to call out that um, this calendar is a little bit different than previous calendars. And the reason for that is, one, we do have a uh, presidential election this year. And when there is a presidential election, because we do hold elections here, um, or voting, excuse me, the ability to vote here, there are certain dates that we cannot hold meetings. So people can actually show up and vote and not be interrupted. And so one of those dates is the 27th of February, where we would have normally had a second meeting in February. That is a blackout date. Um, and so instead of trying to schedule a different meeting, we just are proposing that we don't have a meeting altogether. Um, and then uh, the second one that probably is a change is last um, is National Night Out, which is the first Tuesday of August. And so um, I wanted to highlight this on our calendar because I know that um, as commissioners, but also as residents, you all are involved in your communities. And so just making sure we highlight that on the calendar that we will be out in the community for National Night Out and supporting uh, supporting that with our colleagues um, across the city. Um, I do know that it's, you know, police really have that, but our elected officials and so many different departments and divisions really show up for National Night Out. So highlighting that as well as um, because last year we had the Bloomington Housing Action Team meeting, and it happened on National Night Out, and we won't do that again. We actually will just be out um, enjoying National Night Out with our community here in Bloomington. Um, but then you will see where we would have had a, our first meeting in August. That is the primary election. So we will not have a meeting um, until August 27th. And then um, lastly, uh, what is on here is the November 1st, Tuesday in November, which is the election day. Now, we wouldn't have normally had a meeting, but I just thought it would be best to just keep all the election um, dates on the calendar for you to view. And so uh, with that, I just want to highlight that I just mentioned that there are two months in particular that we would not have um, a second meeting, which are February and August, lastly, December. I am proposing that we move the December meeting to the third Tuesday, just because of how the last meeting in November falls with um, holiday at the end of November and then with um, holidays at the end of December. It's just easier to just go ahead and schedule for the third Tuesday in December. And so just highlighting that because instead of this proposal being 24 meetings for the 2024 calendar year, it's actually 22 meetings. Um, and then adding January 2025 and February 2025, because we normally have our annual meeting in February, so we should have the calendar up until that point. So with that, I can stand for any questions. Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve the 2024 HRA board meeting calendar until the next annual meeting. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions, as she said, we'd be looking for a motion to approve the 2024 HRA board meeting calendar until the next annual meeting. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Mueller. 
and a second by Commissioner Doblinger to uh, approve the 2024 HRA board meeting calendar until the next annual meeting. Moving on to item 5.2 is the 2024 HRA work plan. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Chair Huheen. Um, so I like to provide uh, the 2023 accomplishments for the HRA in writing for you. Um, I know we just had a great presentation by Mr. Niemeyer and Ms. Lincoln. Um, there are some things that don't actually get captured with the data um, that I just like to highlight for you. And so in 2023, uh, I always say we have five buckets that everything fits into operational, housing stability, home ownership pathways, housing preservation, and housing creation. Um, we did a lot under operational. Um, whereas we have software for our housing choice voucher program, we updated our administrative plan for the housing choice voucher program. Uh, we relaunched the Bloomington Housing Action Team with a collaborative focus of other boards and commissions within the city. Um, we did host a Bloom in Bloomington intern uh, for the HRA. We will be doing that again in uh, 2024. Um, we were a part of the resilient com communities and heard the return on investment analysis that was conducted by the University of Minnesota students and planning division really led um, the work with that as well as our assistant HRA administrator Anna Salvador. Um, we revamped the All Things Housing Report, and it was, um, it was revamped last year, and then you saw that update uh, just now in the presentation. We were supportive of the single-family and two-family zoning amendments that did pass. The HRA board did provide a letter of support um, for what planning was planning commission was bringing forward. We had our HRA resources information page and communications completed and put out for more people to know and understand what the HRA does and how they can access that. Uh, we did have loan forgiveness of about $1.3 million on properties that we own um, by Hennepin County, and that was really a, a big deal to get that forgiveness. And then the HRA completed its three-year strategic plan that was HRA-specific. Um, that was all operational, and that is just a few words, but that was a lot of work that staff carried and completed in 2023, and that was just the operational side. Um, so moving on to housing stability, uh, the state of homelessness assessment was completed with recommendations. Um, the schools, the housing program was launched. This is a partnership with Bloomington Public Schools in Hennepin County, but the HRA acts in a supportive role for what Bloomington Public Schools may need. We were added as the city of Bloomington with representation by the HRA on the Heading Home Hennepin Executive Committee. Uh, this is the Hennepin count the continuum of care plan, so it's around people experiencing homelessness, and the continuum of care plan is an agreement that Hennepin County has with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and therefore it requires an executive committee to make those decisions on funding and, and different things that come out of that, and so we are now on that committee um, as of 2023, and Bloomington is the only suburb represented on that committee. Um, we did host our eviction prevention clinic and renters resource fair. And then we expanded housing assistance programs for specific populations, as you saw with the Foster Youth to Independence, as well as the VASH, which is a veterans assistant. So um, that under housing stability, home ownership pathways, we talked about our down payment assistance program and the use of it. We increased journey to home ownership and our home stretch education offerings. As you saw, there was 108 registrants just for journey to home ownership. We did not include home stretch in that, but just um, for that course alone. Um, which is offered in English, Spanish, and Somali. We had 108 registrants and nine people went on to purchase homes. Um, we entered into a strategic partnership with Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity to support their special purpose credit program, which is a down payment assistance program for Bloomington households. And we received Minnesota Housing's homeownership capacity grant um, to further our uh, goals as we work in our rental homes for future home buyers program. And that was the grant of $45,000. In housing preservation, we did outsource property management and maintenance for HRA-owned property. And as we are working through that, working through the relationship and how we, um, the standard that we have and expectations that we have, um, we have started rehabilitation of HRA-owned property for energy efficiency and capital improvements. Our home improvement loan program increased offerings. As you heard, we go up to $60,000, including accessibility improvements. Um, and then our housing maintenance repair and services expansions, where we work with a Brush with Kindness, which is a Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity program, 
um, and senior community services around um, different repairs and requirements to make sure people have a healthy, safe home that they can stay in. Lastly, housing creation, the Minnesota Housing Impact Fund Award. This is the um, almost $3.2 million for our Bloomington Affordable Home Ownership Program. We have preliminary approval for two single-family homes. And when I say preliminary approval, I only mean at the HRA, not the Planning Commission yet, um, for two single-family homes with accessory dwelling units on an HRA-owned lot. We have three homes that um, are, have been supported for affordable home ownership with our partnership with Homes Within Reach. That is the West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust Program. And then we have two developments under construction, Oxboro Heights Senior and Noble Apartments. And so that's a lot that staff has moved forward over a course of, I want to say, 12 short months um, because that includes holidays and different things in there. And so that's just a lot of work that staff are doing day in and day out um, for the HRA accomplishments that we had in 2023. You will also see more detailed information um, on the numbers. Uh, I like to do housing by the numbers. And so Mr. Niemeyer um, did go over quite a bit of this already, so I will not repeat it. Um, and so with that, I have the 2024 HRA work plan. This had came back, come before you for discussion. And um, with that discussion, we did um, update it based on that information. One of the, um, the things that we did make sure to update and call out um, was the staff and board retreat, actually putting that on the work plan um, to make sure we have that, that we have that time of growing and gathering together um, as we are all serving one purpose, but we have different roles in that. Um, and then I added community events, just calling that out because I also heard from you all that you want to really highlight that we are in community, that we're not just, you're not just here on the second and fourth Tuesday making decisions, that you also are doing a lot more and engaged in a lot more. And so um, we still have the same areas of operational housing stability, home ownership pathways, housing preservation, and housing creation. And I just really want to highlight that not proposing anything new for 2024 after um, so much in 2023 that there are some new things from 2023 that we will be looking to implement in 2024. Um, but I do want to bring your attention to housing preservation and the last bullet that says local affordable housing aid, LAHA. I just want to tell you that this is the funding from the states that is around the sales tax that is that has is gone into place where Bloomington is expected to see, receive some funding, but it's supposed to be eligible activities related to housing. I added it here. This is a decision of the city council because the money would come to the city of Bloomington. Um, and so um, have prepared information and have discussions of um, ready to have them later this year. Uh, with city council around those eligible activities and then what does that look like? So I just wanted to highlight what that was. I'm not proposing anything new. Just want to bring you back to um, why that is on there. And with that, I can stand for any questions um, before I'm looking for a motion of approval of our 2024 work plan. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, hearing no questions, we'd be looking for a motion to approve the 2024 HRA work plan. We have a motion by Commissioner Wooten and a second by Commissioner Mua to approve the 2024 HRA work plan. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item 5.3 is the designation of official depositories. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, we will be looking for the HRA, for a motion for the HRA board to designate the, bank, designate the banks listed as HRA depositories for 2024. So I want to um, first say that we would like to you to consider and approve um, continuing with our depositories of U.S. Bank and PM Financial Network, also known as the 4M Fund. In addition to that, um, there is a list of depository, cer certificate of deposit investment um, entities that we would like to get approved to be able to look at investing with those depositories in particular. 
I just want to say that what this is is that the finance department began investing in certificates of deposit, CDs, in 2020, which are allowed under both the state statute and the city's investment policy, of which the HRA did adopt um, quite a while ago. Investing funds in our local bank supports the Bloomington Tomorrow Together priority of equitable economic growth through participation in the local economy. And by investing in our local banks, both within the city and surrounding community, we are supporting local businesses. When the banks in turn loan money to local businesses and residents, we are also supporting the overall community. Because it's such a long list, I will not read this list, but it is in your packet and that packet and agenda is public. Um, and so I would be looking for a motion to approve that. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions, we'll be looking for a motion to uh, designate the banks listed as HRA depositories for 2024. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Mueller and a second by Commissioner Doblinger to designate the banks listed as HRA depositories for 2024. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item 5.3 is designation of electronic funds transfer. May we have the staff report? Thank you, uh, Chair. So in accordance with Minnesota Statute 471.38, governing electronic funds transfer, the City of Bloomington and the Bloomington Housing and Redevelopment Authority must meet all the following provisions. That the governing body on an annual basis this evening will delegate the HRA administrator as the designee to make electronic fund transfers that the dispersing banks of the Bloomington HRA will keep on file a certified copy of the delegation of authority, that all electronic funds transfers shall have proper approvals and supporting documentation as required of all city and HRA disbursements. Written confirmation of all transactions must be made within one business day after the transaction. The city council notifications of all disbursements types are governed by the city charter, section 2.52 and that the authority desires to delegate the authority to make electronic fund transfers to the administrator of the authority. With that, I will be looking for a motion to um, approve the electronic fund transfer designations for 2024. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions, we'll be looking for the motion to approve the electronic funds transfer designation of 2024. We have a motion by Commissioner Doblinger. Second. Second by Commissioner Mueller to approve the electronic funds transfer designation for 2024. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item 5.5 is the designation of investment brokers. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Chair Huheem. Um, I will provide the staff report for item 5.5, designation of investment brokers. Um, but I do want to say we need to go back to item 5.1 and take a full board vote. Uh, we had a motion in a second, but we did not do a vote. Um, apologize. It's all right. So we'll <laughs> go with 5.5, but just know we need to return to 5.1. Okay. Um, so item 5.5, designation of investment brokers. Um, I am looking for the HRA board to designate the following entities to continue to be official investment brokers for the HRA. This is five separate motions. It is FHN Financial, Great Pacific Securities, RBC Capital Markets, LLC, U.S. Bank, and Vining Sparks, IBG. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions, we will be looking for a motion to designate FHN Financial as official investment broker. We have a motion by Commissioner Mua. Second. Second by Commissioner Mueller to designate FHN Financial as the official investment broker. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. We will now be looking for a motion to designate Great Pacific Securities as official investment broker. We have a motion by Commissioner Mua, a second by Commissioner Doblinger to designate Great Pacific Securities as official investment broker. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Motion to designate RBC Capital Markets, LLC, as official investment broker. So moved. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Wooten, a second by Commissioner Mua, to designate RBC Capital Mar Markets, LLC, as official investment broker. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Uh, motion to designate U.S. Bank as official investment broker. We have a motion by Commissioner Doblinger. Second. And a second by Commissioner Mueller to designate U.S. Bank as official investment broker. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. And finally, a motion to designate Vining Sparks IBG as official investment broker. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Mueller and a second by Commissioner Wooten to designate Vining Sparks IBG as official investment broker. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. We will move back to item 5.1. Due to my error, I do apologize. I did not call for a vote. So we would be looking for a, I guess we would, the motion has been first and seconded motion, um, by Mueller and seconded by Commissioner Doblinger to approve the HRA board meeting calendar. Was there any discussion? Hearing none, we will now look for all those in favor by signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Okay, now we will be moving on to item 5.6, which is the designation of official newspaper. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Chair Huheem. Uh, the HRA board is requested to approve designating the Sun Current um, to continue as the official newspaper. Um, it is currently the official newspaper, and staff recommends that continuation. Is there any questions? Hearing none, we'll be looking for a motion to approve designation or designating Sun Current as official newspaper. So oh yes. we have um, a motion by Commissioner Doblinger, and I will second it. So a second by Commissioner Hukim to approve designating Sun Current as official newspaper. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6 0. Moving on to 5.7 is the appointment of external auditor. We, may we have the staff report on that? Yes, thank you, Chair Huheen. The HRA board is asked to designate Red Path and Company as the external auditor for the fiscal year ending 2023. On November 14th of 2022, the city council had approved a contract with Red Path as the city's external auditor for the fiscal year ending in 2022 through year ending 2026 financials. Uh, Red Path and Company is on a not to exceed amount of six hundred sixty-seven thousand six hundred dollars through January first, twenty twenty-seven. Of that, one hundred thirty-three thousand one hundred dollars is for HRA services, where the balance is for city services, and sixty-five thousand dollars for port services. With that, I'll be looking for a motion for approval. Is there any questions? Hearing no questions, we'll be looking for a motion to designate Red Path and Company as the HRA's external auditor for the fiscal year ending 2023. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Mueller and a second by Commissioner Mua to designate Red Path and Company as the HRA's external auditor for fiscal year ending 2023. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item 5.8 is the appointment of municipal, municipal off advisor. Pardon me. Thank you, Chair Huheem. The board is asked to reaffirm Baker Tilly US LLP, which is also better known as Baker Tilly, as the municipal advisor for 2024. The 2023-2027 services agreement was approved by City Council on December 19, 2022. The not-to-exceed amount is $750,000 for the five-year agreement, which is split up between the City Council, HRA, and Port Authority. It is expected that all municipal advisor services for Bloomington will be led by Elizabeth Bergman. As part of a normal annual organizational business process, the municipal advisor must be named. Are there any questions? Hearing no questions, we'd be making a motion to approve Baker Tilly as the HRA Board's Municipal Advisor for 2024. We have a motion by Commissioner Wooten, second by Commissioner Doblinger, to approve Baker Tilly as the HRA Board's Municipal Advisor for 2024. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. 
Moving on to 5.9 is the appointment of bond, bond counsel. May we have the staff report? Thank you, Chair Huheen. The HRA Board is asked to reaffirm Kennedy and Graven Chartered, better known as Kennedy and Graven, as Bond Council for 2024. The 2022-2024 Services Agreement was approved by the City Council on May 9th, 2022. 2024 fees include attorneys at $250 per hour and paralegals at $150 per hour. It is expected that all Bond Council services for the Bloomington HRA as well as the Port Authority, will be performed by Julie Eddington. And I'd be looking for a motion of approval. Is there any questions? Hearing no questions, there, we're looking for a motion to approve Kennedy and Graven as the HRA's, HRA Board's Bond Council for 2024. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Mueller. Second. And a second by Commissioner Wooten to approve Kennedy and Graven as the HRA Board's Bond Council for 2024. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Moving on to item 5.10 is the HRA Board Officer Elections. Thank you, Chair Huheem. Um, so the election of HRA Board Officers is for a secretary, a vice chair, and a chair. Um, what will happen in this process is that current HRA Board members will make a voice nomination for each position. A nomination does need to be seconded to move forward. Board members will be asked to vote by roll call, and the process is repeated for each officer position. The new officers will preside at the next regularly scheduled meeting of the HRA board, which is March 12, 2024. Um, per the bylaws, the officers of the HRA can, shall consist of a chair, vice chair, and secretary, and such other officers as shall from time to time be chosen and appointed by the commissioners. The role of the chair is to be selected by the commissioners and preside at all meetings of the commissioners. As required, the chair will be responsible for certification of official actions of the HRA. The vice chair shall be selected by the commissioners and preside at all meetings of the commissioners in the absence of the chair and shall perform such other duties as may be assigned by the commissioners. In, case, in the case of death, retirement, or resignation of the chair, the vice chair shall perform and be vested with all the duties and powers of the chair until such time as a new chair is chosen by the commissioners. And then the secretary. The secretary shall also be selected by the commissioners, and the secretary shall be responsible for attesting official actions of the HRA. And I'll turn it over to you, chair, and commissioners for your procedure on electing officers. Thank you. So, so to begin with, the HRA officers that will be appointed tonight will assume their positions after adjournment of this meeting. So the procedure will be that I will, I will open the floor for nominations of chair, vice chair, and secretary, and then we will be taking nominations, seconding those, and moving forward. So as per this little oh geez, handy dandy note here, we will be looking for um, a nomination first for secretary. So I will open the floor for nominations for secretary. I nominate Wooten, <laughs> Commissioner Wooten, caught my brain. Okay. The chair recognizes that the member making the nomination, Com um, Commissioner Mueller, would like to nominate Commissioner Wooten for secretary. Um, Commissioner Wooten has been nominated for the position. Do you consent for that nomination? Do you accept it? Yes. Okay. And Commissioner Wooten does accept it. Are there any further nominations? Okay. Hearing none. Um, hold on. <laughs> then I will I will say that um, the nominations will be closed for secretary, and then I'm going to be asking for a second motion to nominate Commissioner Wooten as a new secretary. So I have a second. We have Commissioner Mua is seconding, seconding that word, yep, for Commissioner Wooten to be secretary. Is there any discussion? Okay, there is no discussion. So all those in favor of Commissioner Wooten? Oh, I apologize, this will be a roll call vote. Thank you. Huheen? Aye. Mueller? Aye. Wooten? Aye. Mua? Aye. Doblinger? Aye. Ise? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Congratulations, Secretary. Second, we'll be looking for a motion uh, to nominate Vice Chair. 
I'd be taking nominations for vice chair. Commissioner Wooten. Move to nominate Commissioner Mueller. Okay. Commissioner Mueller, would you accept the nomination for a vice chair? Yes. Okay. Are there any further nominations? Hearing no further nominations, I'd be looking for a second um, motion to nominate Commissioner Mueller as vice president or vice chair. Second. Sorry. We have a second by Commissioner Doblinger. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we will take a roll call vote. Huheen. Aye. Mueller. Aye. Wooten. Aye. Mua. Aye. Doblinger. Aye. Ise. Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Now we will be taking a motion to nominate uh, for the position of uh, chair until the next HRI board annual meeting. Are there any nominations? Who to nominate <clears throat> Commissioner Hugheim? I accept the nomination. <laughs> uh, are there any further nominations? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Hearing none, is there a second motion to nominate Commissioner Hugheim as the chair? <laughs> second. We have a second by Commissioner Mueller. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, we will be taking a roll call vote. Huheem. Aye. Mueller. Aye. Wooten. Aye. Mua. Aye. Doblinger. Aye. Ise. Aye. Motion passes 6-0. That concludes our nominations and exceptions. So as stated, these positions will be um, assumed after the adjournment of this meeting. So moving on to item 6.1 is HRA board policy and issues update. Thank you, Chair Huheem. I just wanted to uh, bring forward that a uh, session has started, a uh, Minnesota State Legislature session has started, um, and that uh, we all are a part of an organization or association called NARO, National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. Uh, it does have a regional, a national, and a state chapter. Uh, the state chapter, Minnesota NARO, will be holding their day at the Capitol on Wednesday, Mar February 28th. And so um, if there is interest of any commissioners to attend um, and go to the Capitol and to meet with legislatures around the um, the advocacy efforts that relate specifically to NARO, um, that is an option and availability. Uh, second, I wanted to um, add that we do have uh, the HRA staff here that have been here this whole meeting and um, getting the information, but also they are here to um, just chat with you, but also just recognize the work that everyone has been putting in over the years. Um, but in specifically this evening, we talked about 2023, and it was a lot. It was a very, very heavy lift. Um, so just acknowledging that the work is done by the HRA staff that are present um, here, as well as those um, that have moved on. Um, so just wanted to highlight that. And then lastly, we will be looking to have a HRA retreat. Um, that treat is between the HRA board of commissioners as well as the staff. And so um, when we put all of us together, that is 19 people. So we will be looking to have a retreat um, looking at April 10th during the day. We will be doing um, more of a notification and a notice um, just because it will be the whole board uh, about the location and the time. Um, so I just wanted to bring that forward um, for you all. Uh, just as we are growing and have done so much, um, like I said before, when I added it to the HRA work plan for 2024. Um, and with that, I can stand for any questions or information that you would like to bring up and talk about. Commissioner Wooten. So that will include staff who are split between HRA and Port Authority? Yes, it will. Okay. I just wanted to take a moment and thank staff for being here tonight. It's nice to see a room with some people. So, and your work is very appreciated, and I hope you realize that, and I hope you, you do know that this board really does appreciate all that you do, especially um, when it revolves around the affordable housing within Bloomington. So thank you very much for your dedication and your hard work. Um, what, ha what was pre presented tonight is absolutely amazing to see it in writing and up on the screen of exactly what's been done. So, and that doesn't happen without you. So thank you very much. 
And with that, uh, we will be looking to adjourn the Tuesday, February 13th HRA authority meeting. With the HRA, okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Moua and a second by Commissioner Dolinger to, to adjourn the HRA meeting. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes six to zero.